class. Um, this is a Tuesday. I was up uh, late uh, last night trying to get the first uh, lecture to load onto YouTube. It took several hours, so thanks for your patience. We're going to do lecture number two here, which is um, the section on ethics. So the first few lectures that we're going to be covering here in this class pertain mainly to um, general principles of counseling and some of the qualities and the essentials and some of the competencies that all good therapists are supposed to exhibit. And so naturally a big part of that is going to be a review of professional ethics. And um, ethics are really important in the counseling field. In fact, if you become a counselor and end up getting some sort of a license, uh, either as a clinical psychologist or uh, a marriage and family therapist or something like this, uh, they'll of course require continuing education and always as part of continuing education is the requirement that you brush up on ethical standards and principles um, especially because so many things change especially regarding things like technology best practices and uh, updates on uh, different uh, disorders that come to the fore as being more uh, commonly experienced at, at certain times um, and so it's really important to stay current on these kinds of things. So uh, continuing education will be certainly a part of any therapist's life for the rest of their professional lives. And again, ethics are always a big part of that. We're going to start out today by talking um, about, uh, skipping down here to slide number two, about basically what, why we have ethics and what those are all about. So reading here in the first bullet point, in counseling and mental health, ethics are the moral guidelines that inform how therapists are to conduct themselves and to respond to dilemmas. Um, bullet point two, ethics include rules, but it is more about taking reasonable steps to do what is right. So in these first two bullet points right here, it's important for you to recognize that when we're talking about professional ethics, although there are a few things that every therapist needs to know in terms of rules, um, mainly what we're referring to when we talk about ethics is a process whereby one tries to weigh whether or not to do a certain course of action based on what is reasonable given a certain set of circumstances. So what you'll often find is that you'll be in a particular ethical dilemma for which there's no clear answer. And so what is considered to be ethical is not necessarily that you always come to some conclusion. In fact, you may choose to come to a different conclusion as a course of action than another therapist might. What's important is that you have carefully weighed and considered what the appropriate course of action is. Of course, always keeping in mind that you are to act in the best interests of the client and never in your own best interests, um, if that means that the well-being of the client would be compromised. And so oftentimes what people, when they're asked to adjudicate certain matters, uh, when they're asked to evaluate whether a therapist made a, a correct decision or an incorrect decision, what they want to know is, did a therapist have in their possession uh, good information, and did they go out and seek good information, and did they act appropriately and reasonably based on that information that they received? And furthermore, did they document that, meaning did they write down a summary of how they acted and what they knew at a certain time. And so all of these have to do with ethics. And so as you're going through this lecture, please keep in mind that ethics is not rote memorization of certain rules. Um, it's mainly adopting certain guidelines and trying as best as possible to act reasonably given those ethical guidelines. Notice that sometimes ethics crosses over into legal issues. Uh, for example, if you are a therapist and you uh, uh, are seeing a client and then you talk about uh, the fact that this client has come to see you and you publicize this information, this would obviously be a breach of confidentiality. This is not only something that's considered unethical, it's also considered illegal. You can be prosecuted for breaching confidential information and you could have your license revoked. And so not it's not always the case that what is unethical is always illegal. In fact, ethics are considered to be uh, a higher bar or a higher standard of excellence for therapists to uh, 
uh, abide by. Um, but and, and so what's important is that you're not just acting based on what is legal, but also based on what is ethical. So a big part of what it means to be a competent, capable therapist is that you are very well aware of the ethical guidelines that are spelled out for therapists. Notice that there are different ethical codes depending on your profession. For example, there are some for marriage and family therapists. There are some for pastoral counselors. There are some for social workers. And famously, there are some for psychiatrists. And uh, maybe even more famously than that are the ethical codes for physicians. And uh, you are supposed to abide by the codes uh, in association with your, with your profession. For this class, when we make reference to several ethical principles or guidelines, we'll be talking about the ones from the uh, standpoint of the psychologist. Uh, bullet point three right here gets at that idea of how the process is sometimes more important than the thing itself. And so in, in the last class, we talked a little bit about the difference between content and process, whereas content is what actually is said in a counseling session, and process refers to more about where thematically uh, the counseling process is going. What's, what are some uh, deeper, perhaps hidden, perhaps nonverbal uh, truths that are being conveyed in the counseling process? Here again, uh, we're talking about process, and we're focusing more on what steps did you take, what course of action did you take, given the certain information that you had, as opposed to what decision did you ultimately come to. Um, and we open up here with kind of a discussion question that I would ask you if we were actually meeting in person, and that is, what would you consider to be the most important ethical issues in therapy? Um, for example, if you were to go in and see a counselor, what would you want to know that your counselor was going to do ethically uh, so as to ensure you were getting competent quality care? And whenever I ask this question, of course, as you might expect, uh, the answers that come up again and again are confidentiality, um, professionalism, uh, acting in the best interests of, of the client, not uh, doing things to harm the client, and we'll get into some of these a little bit more specifically. One thing to remember in the background when we consider what is ethical is the question, who is it that we are serving? That is, who, to whom are we responsible when we practice as a therapist? Well, first and foremost, obviously, would be our consumers. The consumers would be the clients who come to see you. Um, maybe indirectly, it could be the clients that, or, or it could be the people that send clients to you. In a way, you could be in service to them. Uh, although, that, that right away, you're met with the issue of confidentiality. Uh, let's say, for example, you know uh, a friend of yours, and uh, your friend has a friend that you don't know, and they send this person to you for counseling, and you've decided that there's enough separation between the two of you uh, to be able to see this person professionally. And then your friend uh, calls you back later and asks, so hey, did you see my friend that I sent to you? you know, obviously, you can't say to that friend yes or no one way or the other um, because that would be a violation of confidentiality. So notice that with confidentiality, it's not just that you can't say what happens in the course of therapy. You can't even acknowledge that you're seeing somebody in therapy. That in and of itself is considered to be a violation of confidentiality. By the way, you may notice that there are violations of confidentiality all over the place that people don't make too big of a deal about. If you've ever gone to a doctor's office and they call out your name to come in to uh, see the doctor, that's technically a violation of your privacy. Your, uh, people in the waiting room are not supposed to know your name uh, when they call out your name. Uh, that's supposed to be handled a lot more discreetly, and it sounds like most places still haven't figured out how to do that. Uh, I, I once went to a chiropractor's office, and in that chiropractor's office, they uh, had a chart up on the wall, and it said, Welcome new patients for April of 2017. And it had a list of about 30 patients' names up on the wall that anybody could see. That was a clear violation of confidentiality. And I did speak to them about that and said I did not want my name to be up on that board. So a lot. it's amazing how in the medical field, sometimes medical records and medical information are treated with a great deal of confidentiality. But in terms of just informally and casually dropping people's names, that seems to be something that is not taken quite as seriously. As a therapist, it is absolutely essential that you take that very seriously and do not let that slide. Um, who else do we serve in our capacities as therapists? Well, we serve science. Uh, 
in a way, we're committed to uh, coming doing research on um, particular disorders, on particular forms of treatment that are the most effective. We're not supposed to be practicing something outside of our area of expertise, and we're only supposed to be using the kinds of techniques that are supposed to be effective in treating people effectively. And so in that sense, we're supposed to be uh, showing a great deal of uh, faithfulness and loyalty and fidelity to that which is scientifically sound, empirically valid. Uh, we're not supposed to uh, be uh, using techniques that have not been well researched. If there's not a good rationale for why we're doing the counseling intervention that we're doing, uh, it does raise the question of why we're doing it. Uh, we also serve the state of California. Uh, the state of California has many psychologists and the need for therapists in the state of California is great. Um, the state of California and the Department of Consumer Affairs has passed something called a patient's bill of rights that is designed to summarize the kinds of things that a patient can reasonably expect to happen while uh, undergoing counseling and psychotherapy, but it also reminds them of what their rights are. Uh, most notably uh, along those lines, the California Department of Consumer Affairs has required that all therapists post in their offices a notice called um, professional therapy never includes sex. And one of the reasons why this requirement has been passed is because in decades past, uh, psychologists have been uh, uh, guilty of engaging in sexual relationships with their clients, which as you probably would imagine, is a clear ethical violation. In fact, not only are you not allowed to have sexual contact with your clients, you're not even allowed to date your clients. And the state has come up with several guidelines for what to do uh, if it happens to be that you would, it, it, you and your uh, patient would like to date. Uh, it is generally very much frowned upon. And as opposed to the idea that a person is innocent until proven guilty, in this scenario, you are guilty until proven innocent. That is to say, uh, you could be in very big trouble if you decide to pursue a romantic relationship with a client and you have to prove to the board that uh, issues your license that the relationship you're engaging in was consensual and non-exploitative. And at a minimum, you are not allowed to uh, see this client for two years after treatment has stopped before you can start dating them. So it's a very, very strict guidelines and they're trying to protect as much as possible the, the boundaries and the well-being of patients involved. The American Psychological Association in 1992 published uh, their, their book called Ethics for Psychologists uh, that gets into a lot of the nitty-gritty details of what is ethical. It is beyond the scope of this class to go into uh, real depth with that book, so we're going to mainly hover at the surface and talk about the big issues that have emerged from those ethics codes. Um, but uh, if you do go on to become licensed someday, you will undoubtedly need to take a class on professional ethics, and you will almost certainly need to buy this book. Um, we serve the California Board of Psychology, which is the, aid, which is the entity that's responsible for issuing licenses uh, to professional psychologists, and there's a different board for marriage and family therapy. We also serve more broadly health care. Uh, because of legislation passed about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, uh, people who have mental health disorders, um, when you are given that kind of a diagnosis, this is called a parity diagnosis. A parity diagnosis means that the diagnosis falls into the same category as medical diagnoses that otherwise qualify for reimbursement from insurance providers. And so, largely speaking, with that action, uh, the world of psychology has largely been swept under the uh, the, the, or it has been included uh, under the larger umbrella term of health care. So is therapy considered medicine? Well, no, of course not, not technically, but therapy is now considered to be a part of a person's broader health care package. And so we know that insurance companies will often include mental health as part of their reimbursement package. And consumers are now demanding it. In fact, a lot of people won't take jobs if their insurance providers don't uh, require or don't allow for coverage or compensation for people uh, getting psychotherapy. So that's a very important development. So in all of these respects, we have to keep in mind as therapists, who is it that we're serving and who has a stake in what it is that we're doing? 
but first and foremost are the consumers, the clients themselves. All right, so this may seem like a rather easy question, but we're getting down here to slide number four. Why ethics? Well, pretty obviously, we want to prevent abuse and exploitation of our clients. Uh, our, the, the client's health and well-being and mental health uh, is our highest priority. People are coming to us with a great deal of vulnerability. They often come in a state of great pain, and uh, it would be very easy for some people to take advantage of people in that kind of situation. And that's why it is incumbent upon us to never do that, to always be thinking about what is most beneficial, beneficial for my client. And keeping that in mind is what helps many people resolve lots of dilemmas. Um, if that is at the forefront of your thoughts as a therapist, uh, chances are you're going to be a very high quality therapist. We need to protect consumers. We also engage in professional ethics in order to protect professionals from false accusations. Uh, sometimes when we uh, uh, enter the world of therapy, it's possible that we could be falsely accused of something. Uh, it's possible definitely for a case to be brought before us even if we haven't done anything wrong, which is why it's very important to practice uh, professional professionally and to uh, operate at the highest level of ethics and to be above reproach in all of your dealings so that you have good records to stand on and that you have your reputation to stand on in case uh, someone decides to bring a false charge against you. So it protects the profession, it protects you, the therapist, the practitioner, it protects consumers, and keeps the reputation of psychology and marriage and family therapy intact. So you can always tell someone who's not going to be a very good therapist when they start to fudge on issues of professionalism or if they get pretty sloppy. If you start noticing someone who um, plays uh, fast with the rules, fast and loose with the rules, uh, you're, you're, you're dealing with someone whose ethical standards are not up to snuff and so it's important that we, uh, ever, that everybody uh, does his or her part. In fact, uh, the ethical codes have very specific guidelines for what you're supposed to do if you find out that another therapist is breaking ethical codes and there are requirements for what you're supposed to do if you confront that person and that person does not decide to begin to act ethically you have to report them in certain circumstances so they take this stuff very very seriously all right moving down to uh, slide number five um, so under the larger umbrella term of wanting to protect the health and well-being of clients is something very very closely uh, related to that and it's listed at the top of almost all people's lists of most important qualities they want to have in a therapist when it comes to ethics and that is uh, the promotion of confidentiality. Confidentiality exists under the larger category of informed consent. Informed consent is always the first step that a psychologist takes or that a therapist takes whenever he or she is about to begin a counseling relationship with a client. Well, what is informed consent? Informed consent, as its name implies, means that you are giving your patient an opportunity to know what they should know going into therapy, you know, what they can reasonably expect, and for them then to be able to provide adequate permission for you to proceed to treat them. So informed consent means that a person knows what they're getting into, more or less, without being able to predict the future, obviously, has a reasonably good idea of what they're about to undergo, and they've had lots of things explained to them. They've had certain policies and procedures explained to them, and then they give permission for, for you to begin a counseling relationship with that person. Informed consent does not only exist in, in uh, psychotherapy, it also exists uh, when you go in to get medical care. You have to sign an informed consent. Uh, sometimes uh, if you've had to go in for surgery or if you've had to go in for a kind of procedure where you have to go under general anesthesia, you may even have to sign a consent form that says that uh, there's, a, a, there's some degree of risk involved in, under, in undergoing this procedure and that it could even include death and uh, you're basically signing away that uh, you are accepting those kinds of risks. For therapy, what you're basically saying when you go through the informed consent process is, um, yes, there's a little bit of an explanation regarding what you can expect, uh, 
but mostly what informed consent involves is statements about confidentiality. So if I'm just going to summarize, what you are supposed to say to your clients is what you say in here in this counseling office stays here. I'm not allowed to talk about it as your therapist. I'm not allowed to bring it up to anybody else. I can't even acknowledge to someone else that you're undergoing treatment. However, part of that informed consent process involves exceptions to confidentiality. So if you go down to bullet point number five here on slide number five, you can see that there's something there called limits of confidentiality. The limits of confidentiality basically say that if you come to therapy, yes, we're not allowed to talk about anything that takes place in this therapy session, but there might be some conditions under which I would have to violate confidentiality. And we're going to go over those uh, here in a moment. Um, informed consent also refers to privilege. Privilege refers to who has access to your file. In the case of an autonomous, healthy, functioning adult, uh, the privilege holder is the patient him or herself. So anyone over the age of 18 who is of sound mind is the holder of privilege, meaning they have access to the file and it is, and you have to get their prior written consent before you say anything about what is happening uh, with that case. So for example, if you want to have a conversation with a patient's physician, you have to get their prior written consent before you can speak to their physician about your case. Um, because they are the holder of privilege, meaning they're the ones who are in charge of what happens to that file. If you are seeing a minor, typically speaking, the holder of privilege will be the parent or legal guardian um, for, that, for that person. So anyone under the age of 18, you must get, print in most cases, in most cases, there are a few exceptions that are beyond the scope of this class, but in most cases, you must get parental consent before you treat a minor. So if you're seeing someone who is 16 years old in counseling, the parents are the holders of privilege for that, for that minor. But when the minor turns 18, then privilege shifts to them. So that's one very important thing, uh, is who is the holder of privilege. Here, um, the, the goal is to promote agency and to get people to think about how they are largely in charge of the therapeutic process, that they're not completely at the mercy of uh, the doctor. They should never be completely ill-informed of what's happening. They should always have some degree of insight into what's happening. Moving down to slide number six uh, is confidentiality. We already talked a little bit about this. Confidentiality is the most important part of therapy. It is another example of what we would call a legal and an ethical issue, and it involves privilege, meaning the person who essentially has access to the file, the person, now the person who owns the file is technically the therapist, but the clients have, are allowed to have reasonable access to that file and to the information inside that file. So that is what we refer to again as privilege. And you're not allowed to talk about what goes on in therapy or what's listed in that file without the client's uh, permission. Now there are exceptions to that, Now that's what we're going to get into right now. So here are a couple of exceptions. Number one, when a person is an imminent danger to themselves or others. So when a person is an imminent, meaning that a person, that it's not just that a person generally is a danger to themselves, it means that at, that at any given point in the immediate future they are likely to be a danger to themselves or others. Um, you have the obligation to breach confidentiality and make sure that that person gets appropriate care. So if they are a danger to self, you are allowed to call a hospital and make sure that they could be evaluated by a psychiatric emergency team uh, or something like that. They can be hospitalized sometimes against their will uh, in accordance to, in the state of California, Welfare and Institutions Code 5150. When it comes to being an imminent danger to others, that is, if a person says, I'm going to hurt someone else, the person must be a readily identifiable victim, or the person must be someone you could reasonably identify, even if it's not a specific person's name. It must, if it is someone who 
uh, could st that that you could do something about directly to prevent a person from getting hurt. It's it's vital that you act upon that and uh, breach confidentiality. So, for example, if someone says, "I'm going to go home and murder my wife," and I'm going to do it this evening. That is absolutely a, a cause for you to be able to breach confidentiality. That's a very specific person, and you could uh, warn that person. What if a person says, I, I feel so um, agitated and upset, I feel like I could, I could just hurt somebody right now. Well, that's a little bit more vague because they didn't necessarily say an identifiable person. But what if they were to say, I'm going to kill the next person who walks in this room or the, the next person who walks into this building that is even though that's not technically an identifiable person it, it does put you in the position of being able to reason, reasonably prevent uh, violence to take place to a person uh, who would be within your midst so it, it the language here starts to get a little bit fuzzy but it's very important that you remember that if it's something that you could act directly upon and you know basically the target or the direction or the location of this intended violence, you are supposed to breach confidentiality. And this next case that we're going to be talking about here in just a few minutes gets precisely at who it is that we're supposed to call. So when it comes to a person who is an imminent danger to someone else, so not just a danger to self, not a danger to self, but a danger to others, you have to call the authorities, you have to call the police, or you have to call some sort of like a psychiatric a medical team who could come out and restrain the person. But, and this is what the case was all about that we're about to talk about, you have to warn the person involved who's, who's on the receiving end of that threat. So in the case of a patient who says, I'm going to go home and murder my wife tonight, you have to call the wife. That's what's called a duty to warn. And the reason why this became a case is because of the case of Tatiana Tarasov uh, back in the 1970s. We're going to get to that in just, just one moment. One more situation under which, or a couple more situations under which you must breach confidentiality. When a person is gravely disabled, a person who's gravely disabled is a person who is unable to care for themselves physically or medically and could reasonably be expected to be in a life-threatening situation because of negligent care. Um, at any moment. So a person who requires hospitalization, for example. Um, a classic example of this would be a person who's very disoriented, say, uh, wandering in the middle of a street. Uh, they appear to be intoxicated. They appear to be oblivious to oncoming traffic. Now, this may not be a patient of yours, but let's just say that you had a patient of yours or someone was in your care who looked like this. That would be an example of someone who may not be saying, I want to kill myself, but because of how they're behaving, they are their life is, is in imminent danger. So it's not because they would want to harm themselves specifically, but because they're completely unable to care for themselves. It's very important that you, in that situation, you get that person appropriate care. One other thing, when you are breaching, uh, uh, or when you are broaching the subject of confidentiality, when you are actually talking to someone who's a, a care provider and you are giving your report, you are only allowed to give information in that report that is relevant to the nature of the danger. So if you're saying to the police, for example, I have a patient right now who's saying he wants to go and murder the next uh, person who walks into this clinic and I'm afraid he might have a gun or something like this, you can't then go on and on and talk to the police about how this person is uh, being treated for alcoholism, and they've made good progress in the last few years, but they're having some marital issues. You can't start getting into other aspects that aren't relevant to the, to the imminent danger. So remember that just because you have to breach confidentiality in some circumstances, that does not authorize you to give a total breach of confidentiality in, uh, in those situations. So that's an important thing. So we've talked about d imminent danger to self, imminent danger to others. We've talked about gravely disabled. Now we need to talk about abuse. So these are the kinds of abuse that must be reported. Suspected physical or sexual abuse of a minor or suspected physical or uh, sexual or financial abuse of an elder or dependent adult. So notice here that the, the, the key term is suspected. 
which means that it is not up to you as a mandated reporter, that is someone who needs to report if they learn this kind of information. It's not up to you to try to adjudicate or evaluate whether or not abuse has taken place. That decision has been made for you. All you have to do is suspect, and as soon as you suspect, then you have to make the call and let the authorities and the experts decide whether or not there is a case there. The reason why they have that rule is to prevent people from talking themselves out of making a phone call like that because they just don't want to get involved or it would be too much work. So those are the other instances under which confidentiality uh, must, be, must be breached. Um, then there's one other situation too, and that is if a person has a medical emergency while they are in your care. So say like a a client is walking into your office, and in the middle of your therapy session, they trip and fall, and they crack their head open. And now they have a brain injury, and their head is bleeding pretty profusely. You have to call. You have the right to call, and you have to call an ambulance to get the appropriate medical care for this person. They may be unable to care for themselves. And again, the same rule applies. You're only allowed to give information that's necessary for them to get appropriate care, you can't call the ambulance and say, yeah, this guy's coming in to talk to me about his marital problems. Again, you can only cover what's appropriate to the nature of the case. All right, so we talked a little bit about um, the famous case of Tatiana Tarasov back in the 1970s that involved the uh, duty to warn. So we're going to cover that right now. If you skip down to uh, slide number seven, uh, here's a picture of Cowell Memorial Hospital in Berkeley, California. I'm not sure if this building is still there or if it's, I think it actually may have been torn down, but this is where this infamous incident happened, and uh, we're going to talk about that in uh, part two of uh, this coming lecture.